Langford Chapel. And welcome also to those who are watching online. Uh, this is the second of our three evenings with Barry King introducing. I didn't think you wanted to see my face, but there we are. I'm a little too near the other microphone. That was the reason for moving over, but fair enough. So uh, this is the second of our three evenings. Uh, Barry has been doing with us a tour of Greece. We've had some feedback from those who watched online last night uh, who were encouraged and helped by it. And we trust that that was the same for those of you who are here. And if you're here for the first time, particularly for the first time in this chapel, a particular welcome to you. Now we're just going to commend this time to the Lord uh, in a brief prayer. And then I'm going to hand over to to Barry. Father, we thank you that we can come here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the way you have blessed this church over 175 years. And we thank you for the encouragement we find as we're now able to come together uh, in more numbers than we have been able to for so long. We pray that as Barry speaks to us, your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts. And Lord, if we don't have faith, that you will help us to discover the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. And for those of us who know and love the Savior, we pray that we may be drawn more near to him and to go on our way rejoicing. For we ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. Well, again, it's a privilege to be with you this evening and uh, a real joy to be able to spend these few days with you taking a tour of Greece. And we enjoyed our time together uh, last night as we were uh, journeying uh, with Paul and his traveling companions uh, from Troas across the Aegean Sea to uh, Samothrace. Uh, to the European uh, mainland at Neapolis, and then via the Ignatian Way in to Philippi. And what remarkable things took place there in Philippi as we saw uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, receive the glory and honor that he deserves in the planting of a new church there. Uh, for his glory. And it was a great uh, reminder of how the Lord uh, sovereignly and providentially works in all things uh, to accomplish his own purposes and especially to bring glory to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, as it were, we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to get uh, back on the coach and we're going to make our way uh, to our next stop, which is uh, once again in the province of Macedonia, uh, a city called Thessalonica. But before we do, I thought it might be helpful if I simply read the first uh, nine or 10 verses of Acts chapter 17, just to give you some idea uh, beforehand of some of the ground that we'll be seeking to cover this evening. So we're going to begin with verse 1 of Acts chapter 17. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, 
This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authority shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Well, I wonder if we might uh, come to God once more in prayer. Let's pray. Our great God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of meeting together here this evening. Thank you for each of these friends who have come uh, in person and also those who may be viewing via the internet. And we pray that all who hear this talk will find it spiritually helpful and profitable and that the truths which we hear would indeed change and transform our lives. Even as Paul and Silas were accused of being those who turned the world upside down. May you show us tonight how we as your people might do that very thing in the places where we live and serve today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we set off from Philippi, our first stops along the way are at places called Amphipolis and Apollonia. Now, Paul and Silas were merely passing through. If they stopped, it wasn't for long at all. Because the scripture plainly says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. One of the things just to think about is the Apostle Paul didn't stop in every place through which he passed. And he didn't stay in every place which he visited. There were some places that he seemingly passed through on his way to other places. Now, he wasn't doing this indiscriminately. He wasn't doing this without a sense of purpose and direction. As was mentioned last evening, Paul tended to go to those places where there were concentrations of Jewish people. So when he went to Philippi, though there were not sufficient Jewish families there for a synagogue, there were sufficient Jewish families to have a place of prayer. And so we had a very effective ministry amongst them there. And now as he sets off from Philippi, he passes through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia because apparently there would not have been uh, residential concentrations of Jewish people there. And so he's merely passing through. It's when he comes to Thessalonica 
that he stays because there, there was a synagogue of the Jews. It'd be useful to remind you of Paul's uh, way of traveling from place to place. Of course, he will have traveled uh, by boat from uh, Troas uh, to Samothrace and then on to Neapolis. But when he came to Neapolis, he was able to join uh, the Roman road, uh, what was called the Ignatian Way. And he would have joined this there. Uh, just, uh, you see, uh, on the coast, he would have journeyed into Philippi. And then you can see how he would come back to Amphipolis and Apollonia. Now, if you visit this part of northern Greece, you can see uh, that there are parts of the old Roman road that you can still see today. Now, last night, we looked at a bit of the Ignatian way uh, between Neapolis and Philippi, and this is what uh, that same road would look like uh, as it's going out of Philippi in the direction of Amphipolis, uh, Apollonia, and ultimately Thessalonica. And so here is Paul and Silas and Timothy uh, making their way to Thessalonica. Now, I left a name out. I did so intentionally. It's the name Luke. Because up until we arrive in Philippi, in the book of Acts, we have we, 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 throughout this second missionary journey. But then when you come to Acts chapter 17, verse 1, well, it then begins to read, they, they, they. And so what has happened is Luke has remained behind in Philippi. And so now he is reporting on the activities of others, not activities in which he is personally involved. You say, well, what was Luke up to in Philippi? Well, you remember that Paul would do work in a place like Ephesus, but then he would leave Timothy to further establish the work. Or Paul would do work in a place like uh, the Isle of Crete, uh, but then he would leave Titus there to further establish the work. And so how do you get from this very uh, new church that we see in Acts chapter 16 up to this more fully developed church that we see in Philippians 1.1, where there's not only an established membership, but there's also a recognized um, pastorate and a diaconate. Uh, how do you suppose the church reached that point of maturity? Luke would have been left behind there to exercise a continuing ministry in Philippi that would further establish the work of the gospel there in that place. And later, it's very easy to see when Luke rejoins this missionary team because we go back to we, we, we. And you'll just look for that as you read through the Acts of the Apostles. But here we are, we've left Philippi and we've journeyed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and we are on our way to Thessalonica. Only one thing remaining to do. I need to show you a site here between Philippi and Thessalonica. And the question is, does anyone here tonight know whether this is Amphipolis or Apollonia? The prize tonight goes to the one who can tell us. And I say us because I don't know either. Uh, this is either Amphipolis or Apollonia, but no one is really quite sure. Have you ever been on one of these tours? It might be in London or might be somewhere else in the country or on the continent. And you have a tour guide who says, this may very well have been 
And then he tells you something outlandish that could have happened there, but probably didn't. Uh, well, we know in this instance that this is either uh, Amphipolis or Apollonia, but we're not exactly sure which one. Uh, but that's what remains. And I must be honest, it does look very hot there, doesn't it? And so our uh, uh, Greek climate that we have uh, brought with us for these few days uh, this week uh, sort of pales in comparison to this. Well, now we have left Philippi, we passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and we have finally arrived in Thessalonica. And as intimated a moment ago, the reason for stopping there is there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, that ancient synagogue has long since been destroyed, but you do have what is an iconic picture of the remains of ancient Thessalonica that you may very well have seen somewhere before. I don't know, some of you may, uh, being well-traveled, uh, have uh, seen it. Uh, with your own eyes. But these are the impressive remains of ancient Thessalonica. And it must have been a very impressive place. Uh, it was a city, and as I was saying last night, city didn't necessarily mean immensity. It's not Beijing, Moscow, Lagos, you know, just immensity, but it is density, very densely populated, and this is Thessalonica. And there was a, a large concentration of Jewish people there, not least because the Roman emperor at the time, a man by the name of Claudius, had issued an edict of expulsion that had compelled all of the Jewish people living in Rome to leave the city. And so there was a Jewish diaspora that has spread out into other parts of the Roman Empire because Claudius has compelled them to leave the city. It's this same uh, edict of expulsion that would give rise to uh, friends that we'll meet tomorrow evening, Aquila and Priscilla, leaving Rome and going to Corinth. Now, what was this controversy about in Rome? What was it that caused Claudius to say, all right, best thing we can do is just say all the Jews need to leave Rome. There was a division in the Jewish synagogue about the nature of Messiah. You see, they had an idea of a, uh, a militant and triumphant Messiah who would come and overthrow Rome. However, there were others who had come to believe that Jesus of Nazareth, as difficult to believe as it might have been, was indeed the promised Messiah of Israel come in fact to be the savior of the world. And this controversy in the synagogue at Rome reached such a fever pitch and was creating a bit of you know, disquiet in the city as a whole. And Claudius said enough now. And so he compelled the Jews to leave Rome. Remarkably, it was this one act which actually placed many people providentially in the place where they would hear the gospel. I'll give you an assignment if you have a bit of extra time this summer and want to take me up on it. Perhaps look through the Acts of the Apostles and see how many people were converted in the place where they normally lived. What you may be surprised to find out is that a great many people who were converted 
are people who were relative newcomers to the place where we find them in scripture. Even last night, was Lydia from Philippi? No, Lydia was from Thyatira uh, in what was called Asia Minor in those days, modern day Turkey. She was a, a merchant woman. She was in Philippi, as it were, because of business interest. What about uh, the uh, Philippian jailer? Well, the Philippian jailer would have been posted to Philippi by the Imperial Roman government because Philippi was a colony of Rome. And so we see this all throughout the Acts of the Apostles, even beginning on the day of Pentecost. Where were those 3,000 people from who were converted on the day of Pentecost? Well, you remember the list in Acts chapter 2. They were from 14 different places. They were assembled in Jerusalem because of the celebration of Passover. Well, what could that possibly have to do with us here tonight? Do not underestimate the sovereign purposes of God. And do not underestimate his providential ability to bring to pass all that he purposed. <clears throat> Driving uh, to the chapel this evening and last night as well, I was stunned by how many new houses have been built since I was last here in 2018. Think of that. And I know if, if you live in one of the Langfords, you may not be particularly keen about all these new houses being built. But think about it like this. You've been praying that the gospel would go forth and go forward in this place. You've been praying that people would be converted and added to the church. You've been praying that this church would not only have a 175-year-old history, but that it would have, if the Lord uh, delays his coming, a 175-year-long future, could it be that some of these outsiders in some of these new-build houses are people that God in his kindness and providence has brought to your area for such a time as this? And why would you want to have a tour of Greece when you could have a tour of North Somerset, i tell you what, uh, someone asked me uh, last time I was here why I didn't bring my wife with me. Um, and I've gotten to know you well enough now that I can be honest and tell you why. But she would want to stay. It's lovely around here. And I had the opportunity to see a site or two with George yesterday and then David took me and I saw yet another site or two today. And there are a lot of tourists even around these parts, aren't there? And I just wonder, you might think just someone happening to come in to the chapel while they're on holiday might be a small thing, but it might be a hugely significant thing. You remember three years ago when uh, I was with you and you had done all of that leafleting around the villages and someone was house sitting, really dog watching. They were from America, but were staying here and they received a leaflet and they came to the meeting. Isn't that something? Now we think, well, we want to see God do something here. And he may very well be doing much more here than we even realize. Our faithfulness is something for which we are responsible. Our fruitfulness is something for which God is responsible. Well, you'll forgive me for that little mini sermon uh, that I just felt uh, compelled to throw in. Uh, but this was what was happening there in Thessalonica. So what did Paul do when he was in Thessalonica? Well, there was an accusation that was raised against him. Now, the accusation is really quite serious. They actually accused Paul and those who were with him 
of turning the world upside down. Now, we would look at it from a completely different perspective, and we would say if they did anything at all, they had turned it right side up. But they were accused of having turned the world upside down. And now, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And these people who upset the apple cart in Philippi are now coming here and they're turning our world upside down. And this could have been uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, Paul was in the synagogue and he is proclaiming to the Jews that Christ must suffer and that the Jesus that he was proclaiming to them was Christ. Uh-oh, this is that same issue that had been going on in Rome now coming to Thessalonica. Does Christ have to suffer or do we have a militant and triumphant Messiah? We have a militant and triumphant Christ who overthrows Rome and vanquishes all of our enemies? Or do we have someone who comes like a suffering servant and gives his life even to die on a cross? That message was turning the world upside down. That message about who Jesus was and about why Jesus had come and about what Jesus had accomplished was turning the ancient world upside down. And it had actually come to Thessalonica. But it was not only from the Jews. You remember Paul wrote two letters to the church at Thessalonica. And in the first of these letters, in the last two verses of the first chapter, he said that when he came to them, that they actually turned from the worship of idols to worship the one true and living God. Well, that doesn't sound like Jewish background believers. That sounds much more like the Gentile background believers. So there were people, Jew and Gentile alike, who were having their world turned upside down by the preaching of the gospel and by the planting of churches. Now, um, I wonder what it would take to turn this island upside down. Actually, I know the answer because the answer was given to me this afternoon by my friend David as we were touring around. He said, what if we had uh, 100 faithful churches in Britain? We may have many more than that. We may have somewhat less than that. We don't know, but just for the sake of discussion, what if there are 100 biblically faithful churches in Britain. That's, that's no small thing. What if there are 100? And he said, what if each of those 100 said that within the next two to three years that they would seek to plant another church? Well, mass are not my strong subject, but I think I can even work that out. We're up to, is it 200? Thank you. Just wanted to make sure because I hadn't written it down. But, 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 but we're up to 200. And then because that's just sort of in the DNA of these biblically faithful churches, what if then those 200 churches said, over the next two to three years, uh, we will each seek to plant another new church. And then it happened even just once more. Do you know that we now have between 800 and 1,000 biblically faithful churches in the next 10 years. That would absolutely turn this island right side up, wouldn't it? A thousand biblically faithful churches. Amazing. What would that look like? 
You cannot go to Thessalonica without thinking about the church, just the church in general and the whole matter of church planting in particular because it was Paul's strategy for turning the world upside down. And if we want to have a more limited view and just want to turn our island upside down, this is how we must go about it. Now, if you think about it, if you're considering the church, and by church, again, we don't mean this chapel building, absolutely lovely as it is. It is truly lovely. But we're not talking about this building. And uh, sometimes I have been accused, you know, nothing is as grand as turning the world upside down, but, you know, trying to keep village chapels open. I, I, I will assure you, I have a much higher aspiration than keeping the doors of chapels open. I, I, I don't want to see uh, village chapels survive. I want to see uh, vibrant churches thriving for the glory of God in all places, cities, towns, and villages, and everything in between. But how are we going to see this sort of church planting movement across this island that would turn this island right side up? Well, I feel a little bit like the a proverbial man teaching his grandmother to suck eggs because I'm going to use a farming analogy in uh, what is, in a sense, farming country. You will know some of these things better than I. You're going to sow anything. You have to have a sow. So here you have Paul and Silas and Timothy. They. You've got a small group of people, not a large team, not a well-resourced operation, but you've got a small group, just three men, who actually have a desire to go to Thessalonica and make known the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You really see only one of them taking the lead. It says, and Paul, as was his manner, went in unto them and for three Sabbath days proclaimed that Christ must suffer and that this Jesus I proclaim is Christ. You, if you're going to plant anything, you have to have a sower, right? Yeah, I, I've not seen it and I'm not dropping hints, George. But I've been told that one of the attractions around here is a garden center that's almost second to none. And so I told someone that I was coming down this way and they said, oh, do make sure you see the garden center while you're there. Well, the thing is, you know, you can go to the garden center and you can get fully kitted out and you can buy all of the seed and you can buy everything that you need, but you still can't just come and put it in the shed and expect it to do its work. You actually have to have a sower. You actually have to have a planter. You've actually got to have someone who is the sower who goes forth to sow. You gotta plant something, you gotta have a sower. So that's why you ought to be right behind your pastor. That's why you ought to be right behind those who are seeking to do the work of evangelism. That's why you ought to be right behind those who are seeking to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because they are the sowers who were going forth to sow the seed of the gospel. But you know, you not only have to have a sower, you also have to have some soil. And it's interesting to me, again, remember, he passed through Amphipolis. He passed through Apollonia. He came to Thessalonica. Why? There was a synagogue of the Jews there. And Paul was a Jew. And he had a better understanding religiously and culturally of the Jews. That's where it was best for him to start. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that the soil in Langford and the soil in Leicester and London are very different. And we have to recognize 
that the soil in 2021 is very different than the soil in 1921 or 1821. We have to recognize, you know, sometimes people say if we just had another Spurgeon or if we just had, you know, another Whitfield or if we just had another uh, Wesley and that's, that's all right. Or if we just had another Lloyd-Jones or whatever. But the reality is we can't go to places far away and we can't go to times and seasons long distance from our own and think that what happened there is necessarily going to happen here because this is different soil. And you've got to be a soil analyst in the sense of sort of saying, what's it going to take to make things grow here? And of course, you know, the thing that is of greatest importance is you must pray because you break up the fallow ground often with your prayers and with your tears. There's got to be a sower. There's got to be some soil. And then you do have to have seed. And the seed that we see here is the seed of the word of God in general and the seed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in particular. Uh, Paul and his traveling companions didn't go into Thessalonica just to see the sights just so they could post pictures on Instagram and say, look where we've been, look what we've done. No, it's actually that they are going to this place to sow the seed of the gospel. And we have to recognize that's our primary purpose as well. Now, we're going to be in a place longer than three weeks, normally speaking. But the intention behind what we do, if it's in three weeks, if it's in three days, if it's in three months, three years, three decades, the intention must be the same. Whatever we do must have a very sharp gospel focus and must be directed toward proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as it is to men, women, boys, and girls as they are. And our only see is the word of God. Our only seed is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, do we have remaining confidence in the power of the gospel to change and transform people's lives? And you say, well, the problem is in places like Langford is people don't necessarily think their lives need to be changed and transformed. They look on us and they sort of feel sorry for us because obviously we need the crutch of organized religion. They've got everything. They don't need anything. Uh, they don't need their lives changed and transformed to be like us. <laughs> they think that we need our lives changed in order that we might be like them. But let me remind you, as I think I've heard from a couple of you already, was Saul of Tarsus looking for Christ? Was Saul of Tarsus desiring to become a Christian? Was Saul of Tarsus on a spiritual pursuit to find the Lord Jesus Christ and to know him in all his fullness? No, he was violently opposed he was anti. You know, sometimes that's the best way we can describe our unsaved family or friends. We'll say, well, they're not anti. Paul was. Saul of Tarsus was, was, was anti to the nth degree. But yet God sovereignly and supernaturally changed and transformed his life. And he, through the power of the gospel, can do that same thing even here in Langford. It just takes a sower. It takes some soil and it takes the seed of the gospel. What's remarkable is that we are told that as they were proclaiming the gospel, that some of them 
that is, some of them, the inhabitants of Thessalonica, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So here we're seeing that now a small group at first and then maybe a bit more later on of both Jews and Gentiles began to be persuaded, believe the gospel, and identify themselves with the teaching of Paul and Silas. Now, to what do you attribute that? I attribute that to the Spirit of God. I attribute that to the Spirit of God. Full stop, end of discussion. Um, uh, some, someone uh, asked me very kindly uh, yesterday uh, where, 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 I was, where I was from. And uh, I responded, of course, by saying Dunstable. Uh, just to the north of London, and they looked at me incredulously, uh, and I, I responded in kind and said, well, everyone sounds like this in Dunstable. This is a Dunstable accent, and I'm, I'm still not sure they believed me, but um, um, so I know I come from a different place, uh, different churches, uh, different type uh, worship experiences, different type hymns, so you may have never heard this hymn in your entire life, but uh, when I was a little boy growing up in a Baptist church in Arkansas in the Mid-South in the United States, we sang a hymn that's Brethren We Have Met to Worship. Now, that had nothing to do with open or closed brethren, but that was the hymn, Brethren We Have Met to Worship and Adore the Lord Our God. And that was the opening verse of the hymn, but the one I most remember is the one that said, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Do you know you can leaflet this village multiple times in the year? Do you know you can hold services live and in person or via Zoom and YouTube every night of the week? Do you know you can have your regular services punctuated by special evangelistic events? You can do anything and everything and never see a single person converted because ultimately all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. The Spirit of God did more in three weeks in Thessalonica than we could do in three decades. Now, put that right, in three centuries on our own. Amazing. We need the Spirit. And how do we have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our churches? I think we know. It comes through humbled hearts and bent knees calling on God in prayer. That's how we'll turn the world upside down. You gotta have a sower, there has to be a bit of soil, there has to be some seed, and there has to be the Spirit of God. Could I just uh, leave this with you? It has to be a measure of suffering. I know we would have preferred if we just left that one off. We want to keep these meetings kind of light and accessible. You know, if a newcomer or an outsider visits, we don't want to put suffering up on the screen. Come on now. You know, that, that's not the way you uh, win people over, is it? But the reality is the, the Christian faith is no bait and switch affair. It's no, you know, where you encourage people you know, with this on the front end, when you know uh, the reality of it is something quite different on the other end. Do you know Paul and Silas didn't experience imprisonment in Thessalonica uh, like uh, they did in uh, Philippi? But we do see that Jason, uh, who had extended hospitality to them, uh, was actually drugged before the city authorities Jason was accused of aiding and abetting uh, these uh, advocates of an enemy uh, religion. Uh, he was uh, accused of, uh, of being an accessory before, during, and after the fact uh, of those who were acting against the decrees of Caesar and saying that there was another king, Jesus. And the city authorities were so disturbed by these things that they took money, they levied fines, they took security. Uh, there was real suffering 
One of the things that you'll note, however, if you look at those countries across the world where people are paying the highest price for being Christians, where people are actually suffering for their faith, isn't it sort of counterintuitive, but absolutely true, that those are often the very places where the gospel is progressing most? and people are becoming Christians in larger numbers. And the very reason that they are suffering is because the world is being turned upside down. And some people, for religious reasons, are some, even as we saw last night, for financial reasons, are so disturbed because of this upsetting of the apple cart, this reshuffling of the deck, this turning upside down of their world that they began to oppose. So question, what are we doing today that is so significant that the enemy feels he must oppose it and must inflict suffering upon us to seek to halt and hinder the progress of the kingdom of God? Well, that's what's happening in Thessalonica. That's how we see the world being turned upside down there. I'm going to just mention in closing uh, a place called Berea. Now, Berea does not feature in this tour of Greece. We're just talking about those three places in Greece uh, where we actually have letters that Paul will have written to those churches uh, afterward. But it is significant to note, if you read just verse 10 of uh, chapter 17, that the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night into Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Do you remember anything in particular about the Bereans? It's said of them in just the next verse or two, that they were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica because it said they eagerly received the word and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things they were being told were so. When you visit Berea, be sure to look for this plaque for Acts 17, 11, in Berea, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if those things were so, where these words are inscribed. But then listen to this line. The word of God is a power. Neither hell nor sin gainsay. Fruit and blessing abound in that life where it holds sway. My desire for each of us this evening is that spiritual fruit and blessing might abound in our lives because in our lives, the word of God holds sway. My desire is that the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has turned your world upside down. That you know the reality. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. May indeed this be our testimony. The word of God is a power. Neither hell nor sin gainsay. Fruit and blessing abound in that life where it holds sway. Our Father and our God, may your word hold sway in our hearts and lives. May we believe all that your word teaches us concerning yourself. May we especially believe all that your word tells us concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, how he has lived in our place, the life we couldn't live, how he has died in our place, the death 
we deserve to die. How he has won in our place the victory that we could not win. May his word hold sway in our hearts and lives. Thank you that you've turned our lives right side up. Thank you that you have changed us and transformed us and are doing so by your great power. And we pray you will continue to do so even till that day when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ appears again in great power and glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.